last speaker of the session is Asan Su Kim from Janile Research Campus. And the title of this talk is Flexible Mapping of Visual Scenes to a Heading Representation via Inhibitory Hebbian Plasticity. Good morning, everyone. My name is Song Su Kim. I thank the organizers for this opportunity to present our work. We have seen talks about navigation yesterday and about plasticity in this session. Here, I will combine them and consider plasticity in the context of spatial navigation. This is a scene from Chanelia, where I rely on stable heading representation to know which direction I'm pointed. This is my first trip to Lisbon and in this room, but I, it didn't take me more than a few seconds of just looking around to get my bearings. It is easy to see why this flexibility of heading representation is a need shared across the animal kingdom. We are interested in how the brain flexibly generates stable heading representations across different scenes. To that end, we use the fruit fly. Yesterday, Dan Turner Evans gave an excellent introduction to the fly navigation system, so I'll just briefly recap relevant information. In a toroidal shaped structure called ellipsoid body, there is a set of neurons we call compass neurons that together tile the ellipsoid body. We recorded the activity of the entire population of the compass neurons from the tethered flying fly in a virtual reality arena. In this closed loop experiment, we measure the left and right wing bit amplitude and take the difference to infer the fly's intention of turning and change the orientation of the scene accordingly. In this movie, you can see a bottom-up view of the fly. The blue pattern is the downsampled and monochromatized version of this natural scene. You can see that this small patch of GCAM signal, we simply call a bump, follows the heading. There is a stable angular relationship between the orientation of the scene and the bump position and we call it a pinning offset. This offset is fixed in a fly, but importantly, it varies across flies. For instance, for this scene orientation, this fly has a bump at four o'clock, but in other flies, it may be at one o'clock or even nine o'clock. So why do they vary across flies? One possibility is that the pinning offset depends on experience and we directly tested this hypothesis. To this end, we exploited an important property of the compass system, which is a uh, ring attractor dynamics. This is a di diagram of ring attractor network, which has a lot of components, but the relevant property for our purpose is mutual suppression. In this movie, you see a bump at the top of the ellipsoid body. Now, if you optogenetically activate the left side of the ellipsoid body, the existing bump would disappear and a new bump would appear via mutual suppression, essentially resetting the fly's perception of its heading. Using this property of mutual suppression, we modify the fly's heading representation. This fly is flying in this scene and the bump reliably encodes the fly's body orientation. You can see that for this particular scene orientation shown below, the bump is at four o'clock. Now let's impose an artificial offset to the system. To make sure that all scene orientations are covered, we used an open loop protocol. That is, the fly is not controlling the scene and we enforced an artificial offset across all scene orientations. Then as you can see in this test trial, the offset changed. Let's repeat this protocol again, but now with an offset on the other side of the ellipsoid body. And you can see the offset changed again. We repeated this across many flies, and here x-axis the enforced offset shift amount, and the y-axis is the actual shift amount. And data are aligned along the identity line. Without an opto optogenetic reagent, this pattern does not show up. This is clear evidence of experience-dependent plasticity, or Hebian-like plasticity, somewhere between visual inputs 
and compass neurons. But how do visual inputs get to the compass neurons? This is where we get useful information from anatomy. This is a preliminary result from the emerging fly connectome, which is a collaboration between Google and the Janelia Fly EM team. It is still being proofread, but we can clearly appreciate a lot of details relevant to our question. What you are seeing is a collection of compass neurons which tile the ellipsoid body, and this yellow neuron is one of them. This red neuron, called a ring neuron, makes direct synaptic contacts with all the compass neurons, not just one, as you've seen here. And this ring neuron is garbage and inhibits the postsynaptic compass neuron. There are many ring neurons, and overall, they effectively create an all-to-all -all connections from ring neurons to compass neurons. From previous studies, we also know that many of these ring neurons respond to visual features at a certain location in the scene with receptive field structure that resemble simple cells in the mammalian visual cortex. So overall, these garbage ring neurons, each carrying visual feature information, make direct inhibitory synapses onto the entire population of compass neurons, making them an ideal substrate for the plasticity we observed. Based on this information, we developed a comp computational model. Here is how the model works. These purple and green ring neurons respond to visual features at particular location in the visual field. And the size of these small blobs represent the strength of inhibitory synaptic weights from the ring neurons to compass neurons, which are schematized as wedges of the uh, ellipsoid body. The idea is that if a compass neuron is co-active with a ring neuron, then synapses between those two neurons get depressed. And this synaptic depression is the key to flexibly mapping a visual scene onto the heading representation. Here is a simulation. The black rectangle at the bottom represents the visual scene around the fly. Concentric circles at the top represent the ring neurons with a specific receptive field position, which is color-coded at the bottom. You will see the color brighten uh, when the stimulus activates a particular neuron, like this orange ring neuron. The blue edges represents the bump position of the compass neurons, and gray scale circular matrix represents the synaptic weight between ring neurons and compass neurons with dark means of weak synapse. This white patch represents the synapses between co-active ring neuron and compass neuron. This is where synaptic depression happens. Other synapses on this wedge get potentiated. So over time, these white bands weaken the synaptic weights, creating a dark band of weak synapses. At the end, this process maps each visual orientation onto a particular bump position in the ellipsoid body, something that is visible as a dark spiral when the visual scene is just a single stripe. This is the key idea of this unsupervised learning model. This model can obviously explain the flexible mapping we observed in optogenetic experiments. When a stimulus is at yellow position, the bump should be at the northeast because that's the weakest point for synaptic inhibition. But here, we optogenetically shifted the position of the bump to the other side of the ellipsoid body. Therefore, the synaptic weight of that part should be depressed. And over time, a new offset develops. I should say that the basic idea of this model has been proposed in many other contexts, including head direction cells, grid cells, and in the insect central complex as well. And also, the mathematical formulation of the model was inspired by self-organizing maps. What is really cool about fly central complex is that we can test many predictions of this model in vivo. Let's consider one of its interesting predictions. Here we have a synaptic weight matrix with a single dark spiral. If we now put the fly in a scene with two identical vertical stripes 100, 180 degrees apart, then at the end you would see two bands of synapses, uh, two bands of dark spiral of weak synapses. If we now put the fly back in a scene with only one vertical stripe, there are two potential offsets that can represent the same heading. 
and one of them may win over the other randomly. So in some cases, you would see that the bump offset is shifted 180 degrees from the original one. Here is a physiological result. The offset of the bump relative to a stripe is basically zero. Now let's present two stripes. The offset of the bump to a single stripe is now made increasingly ambiguous. And indeed, when you present a single stripe, the bump shifted 180 degree in this particular fly. Here is another test of prediction. If the plasticity we have seen really depends on experience, we may even be able to flip the direction of heading representation. Here, the direction of the bump motion matches with the scene motion. And now, I optogenetically override the mapping so that the bump moves in the opposite direction. In a test trial, indeed, the bump moves in the opposite direction. I won't be able to tell you about other interesting predictions that we have also tested, but hopefully you get the general idea. <coughs> so in summary, we show that experience-dependent plasticity constantly updates the angular relationship between visual scene orientation and the internal heading representation. We believe this mechanism underlies flexible generation of stable heading representation across different scenes. With that, I'd like to thank Vivek for his support and mentoring, Anne and Larry for exciting collaboration, and all of the Jairama lab members for intense discussion, and Chanelia science teams for support. Finally, I'm opening my own lab at UC Santa Barbara in two weeks, so if you are interested in a postdoc position in my lab, please let me know. Thank you for your attention. Wonderful. There are, there are time for questions, and trainees and postdocs are encouraged to come up. Yes. Uh, is there any behavioral evidence, maybe in a, mm -hmm. a navigation task, that the fly is confused about <laughs> where it is after you do these manipulations? Uh, that's a very interesting question. We are still working on that. Sorry. I have no clear answer to that yet. Yes. Oh, so there's another question. Just very quickly, have you checked in your um, mm -hmm. EM data that the weight matrix is the, that measured fly and really has some feature like this spiral thing in its weight matrix? So in Dan's talk yesterday, actually, we checked the connectivity from ring neurons to the compass neurons. And they indeed connected all to all. So. But then this uh, measuring the synaptic weight directly in the EM data is quite challenging right now. So we actually do not know. Uh, is it possible to just use the volume and spy, which is very So that's something we are trying to do these okay. days. Thanks. Thank you. <laughs> okay. um, this, is a, this was a lovely study. I, um, I was curious to get a sense of how this uh, sort of evolves over time with different scenes? Oh yeah, that's a great question. So, um, so in natural situation, you, are, you have also translation uh, <coughs> signal coming from the visual scene. But that's not something I have personally tested. But uh, Dan Turner Evans used that yesterday and other lab member, Hannah Heberkern, is testing that kind of situation in a 2D navigation system right now. So we will see some results from there. All right, well, uh, let's thank uh, the speaker for a wonderful talk, as well as the um, speakers in the session. Yeah.